Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 247 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. One of the things I love most about medieval writers is their massive enthusiasm for sharing everything they knew about the world and how they made sense of it. This type of writing not only tells us more about an individual's mindset and culture, but also about the wider world they were part of. And I think many of them would be delighted to know that we still read and discuss their work today. One of these enthusiastic writers, who was both a superstar in his day and hugely influential in our understanding of the past, is the Venerable Bede. This week, I spoke with Dr. Michelle P. Brown about the Venerable Bede and his thoughts on pretty much everything. Michelle is a senior research fellow and professor emerita of manuscript studies at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London and a visiting professor at University College London. As well as formerly being curator of illuminated manuscripts at the British Library, Michelle has been hugely influential as a scholar of manuscripts, illumination, and medieval handwriting. She's the author of Art of the Islands, Manuscripts from the Anglo-Saxon Age, and a book on the Lindisfarne Gospels, among others. Her new book is Bede and the Theory of Everything. Our conversation on Bede's life, his contribution to a medieval understanding of everything, and how he has shaped what we know about his world is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Michelle, for being on the podcast. It is an absolute delight to meet you. I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome. Well, not as long as I am to be on with you, Danielle, and to have a chance to actually talk to your many, many, many listeners. So thank you for having me. Ah, such a pleasure. I know it's a pleasure because we've already been chatting for a while. Now we have to turn on the microphones and and get to work. Okay, so your latest book is called Bede and the Theory of Everything. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people have heard of Bede or the Venerable Bede and have like a shadowy idea of who this is. Let's Mm -hmm. get a little bit more concrete as much as we can. Who is this guy? When are we talking about and where are we talking about? Okay, Bede was an Anglo-Saxon one of the Germanic peoples who'd flooded into the gap left by the end of the Roman Empire in the West and the Roman province of Britannia, several generations on since they first started emigrating over from um, Germany and southern Scandinavia. And he was born in 673 in the northeast of England, what's called Northumbria by the Anglo-Saxons. And he died in 735 when he was 62 years old. Now, People might think, well, okay, so what? He's known as the Venerable Bede. He was a saint. Why venerable? Well, because he was acknowledged pretty soon after his death by the Carolingians as well as the Anglo-Saxons, but also in 1899 by the Pope as a doctor of the church. He's the only venerable saint to have come out of Britain and Ireland, or at least the only one to have been officially recognised, as we know there were lots of them. But Bede is perhaps particularly noteworthy and interesting because he wrote one of his most popular and famous works was The History of the English Church and People. And that really invented the term and the concept of England and English because Bede came from a group of people called Angles rather than Saxons or Frisians or Jutes. It's called England, otherwise it would have been Frisia or Saxon land or Saxony, etc. Okay, so, so far so good. We'll go on to talk about the many, many amazing things that he did in his life. He was one of the most prolific writers and he was also considered to be one of the greatest thinkers of the post-Roman age. He spent all of his life from the age of seven in the twin monastery of Monk Weymouth and Jarrow, which had been founded very recently as a sort of social experiment in the northeast of England. And you might think, well, okay, somebody goes into a monastery at seven and stays there until they're 62 and only ever travels as far as we know, about 60, 65 miles away on a few trips to Holy Island, Indisfarne, and to York. What does he know about the world? (laughs) (laughs) We're going to find out. We are (laughs) going to find out. (laughs) Right. So, I mean, this is this is a good question. He's a monk his entire Mm -hmm. life. This is not totally unusual, but it's not totally normal to be given to the church at this time and stay there your whole life. So why do you think he stayed there? 
Okay, so we know because Bede tells us, it's how we know most things about this period, is because Bede tells us, he gives an autobiographical note and certain details about his life in his various works. And he says that when he was seven, he was presented by his kinsmen, he doesn't say his parents, he says his kinsmen, to the new monastery at Monk Wearmouth, which had only just been established by a nobleman called Benedict Biscop. And it's possible that they were related because both of the name Biscop or Badoking, as he was known in Old English, and Beda, which means the one who serves, were both mentioned in earlier king lists of the kings of Lindsay, which is an Anglian kingdom further south in what's now East Anglia. And so it's possible that they were actually related. And that's why Bede was consigned there, either because you know, something had, had happened, he was orphaned perhaps, but more likely because this was something really exciting, really new, and Biscott's wider family wanted to be in on it. Now, presenting him at seven doesn't mean that Bede would have had to have stayed. It was going to become relatively frequent that people who were in the, the more affluent classes and who could afford not to have their kids at home doing work on the farm or later on the battlefield, that they could actually afford to devote somebody to the church, a bit like in the 18th century, when the eldest son would go to the army and the younger one would go to the church, etc. But Bede himself seems to have felt that he was always destined for it, that he was destined for the womb. And in some of his early writings and his commentaries on the biblical text, he focuses upon Samuel, who, of course, is the great kingmaker, King David, for example, and he was conceived by his mother who was having trouble conceiving and was dedicated from the time of his birth to the temple and was given over to a high priest called Eli. Okay. And so Bede couches himself often in this sort of way. And for Bede, as Samuel the Kingmaker, and in his history of the English church and people, he is the one who actually gives us the narrative whether it's strictly factual or not, obviously there's a lot of debate. And as any historian, he had his perspectives, his philosophy and his party prees. But nonetheless, he is a kingmaker. And his Eli is Benedict Biscop's closest ally and partner in establishing the twin monastery at Monk Weirmouth Jarrow, which were founded in 674 to 781, 82. And so that's the period that we're talking about. So Bede comes in a few years after Benedict has started. And when he's 10, 13, he transfers over to the second of Biscop's monasteries at Jarrow. And he dies there when he's 62. Now, the abbot who Benedict Biscop entrusted with his work after his death and who founded with him Jarrow is a chap called Chalfrith. And Chalfrith was Bede's Eli. He was his father figure as well as his mentor. And there's a very moving passage in which, in the lives of the abbots that Bede wrote, that says that at one point when Bede was about 13, the plague that was ravaging the land there, which was every bit as bad as the Black Death, and certainly um, more people were dying pro rata even than COVID, that only Chalfrith and his young charge Bede were alive and able to still help people and also to sing the office, the divine office, and the eight canonical hours of every day and night. So it was a very, very, very personal bond. And much later in life, Bede would relate with a tear in his eye as he's writing it that his beloved Chalfrith sets off to retire in Rome and dies en route taking one of three massive single-volume Bibles as a gift to the Pope, as an ambassador for the English nation, to show that only in these islands, then and now, could the wreckage of the learning of the late antique world and the early Christian world be revived, extended, to form a really good, reliable edition of the Bible in a book which was more a library building than a book. It's massive. <laughs> and it's so convincing in the style of its unsealed script, in its pure Vulgate text, and in the Syriac Byzantine style of its illumination, that it wasn't until the 1880s that it was finally recognised once again as having been made in England, as opposed to by Italo Byzantine and Syriac work people in Italy. And so it went in disguise across the Alps. 
<laughs> to Rome. And it said, I am more Roman than the Romans. I am more Byzantine than the Byzantines. But only in Weymouth Charrow, in the islands at the edge of the known world, sorry, the Americas were not yet discovered by whomsoever. Only there could the scholarship be resumed, picked up, and a publishing enterprise actually of this scale be undertaken again. And in the book, I ventured my opinion on which is Bede's hand in the Codex Amiatinus. And the parts that he's copying are those areas of the Book of Kings, etc., that he was writing commentaries on at that time that, again, relate to this broader vision. So that's just a couple of the things that he did. But can we talk a little bit about his childhood a bit more? Is that okay, Danielle? Of course, of course. Okay. I'm always into the childhood of the people we're yeah. studying because it's well, so you're, influential. Well, you're a mom. You're a mom. <laughs> <It's> yeah, <true. laughs> and and you'll you'll appreciate this because I think for anybody who thinks that Bede is just a dry, fusty old monk, <laughs> imagine imagine this kid of seven. Okay, so he's been given away from his family. He may be coming back into society afterwards. He may not. I think he already is convinced he's found his niche. And what would that be like? Well, he's going into building sites that are like the Zaha Hadid, you know, superstructures of their day. Their like had not been seen since the giants that were the Romans left Hadrian's Wall, etc., up up in that part of the world. And their monuments still littered the landscape. And Benedict Biscop and Chalfrith, along with others such as Wilfred of York, made many pilgrimages across the Alps to Rome. Some went on even further to the Near East. And they brought back books, um, they brought back icons, they brought back panel paintings to hang around the walls. They built in the Roman fashion with dressed masonry, they built beak, and they brought back glaciers and masons from Gaul in the first instance until they became proficient in the techniques with local craftsmen. And so Bede was going into buildings that were just amazing. And you didn't have all the drafts and the damp. You had stained glass windows. You actually had images in them, etc. as well. And you had all of this colour around you and the beauty of art and the singing of music taught to you viva voce by the chief chorister in the papal chapel. You know, this was amazing. This was suddenly you've gone from a farmyard, however well off your family might have been, you've gone into something that's Amazing. You're getting a decent diet, regular diet at least, vegetarian, but regular, and he throve on it. And he's got this incredible intellectual curiosity. And he also already knows about the world. Think about it. A boy of seven who's going to have been sleeping in a communal hall. He's going to know not only about what animals get up to in the in the farmyard where he's been helping, he's going to have heard other grunts in the night. <laughs> he knows a few things about people, mm. okay? And this curiosity just grows and grows and extends. And when he comes into the monasteries, you can imagine him running about. He's getting into everything. He's helping to mix the mortar. He's in danger of putting his fingers into the molten glass because Bede wants to know what makes the world tick. What's that? How does that work? Oh, he must have just driven everybody mad. You know? <laughs> and, and he goes on um, later to write an encyclopedic work on the nature of things, dealing with the physicality and materiality of the world, picking up on the works of Pliny the Elder and other works of people like even Aristotle disseminated out through other sources, Cicero's Aratea on the meaning of the constellations of the stars. And he becomes absorbed in the natural world as well. He's a great supporter as he grows up of the Celtic mission as well as the mission launched from Rome and the continent. And Irish authors are of great interest to him. And one of them, Columbanus, had written around 600, nature is a second scripture in which we perceive God. And Bede looked at everything. He looked at what was under his feet. He looked at what was around him. He looked up to the heavens. And he creates this incredible broad vision and a long view and joined up thinking, which is one of the reasons I think he's such a good person to actually look look at today because I think some of those skills are somewhat in abeyance or, or getting increasingly niched, ironically. But for Bede, it was all there. And as he went on, he learned 
he became fast-tracked. He became a deacon at the age of 19. And at the age of 30, he became a priest, the age that Christ came into his public ministry. So he was obviously recognised as, as a force to to be used and to be reckoned with. In the course of his working life, he wrote at least 40 works. Some scholars would argue as, as much as 60. Now, that's pretty prolific for an academic. And this is real solid stuff, experimental, really tough research, piecing together from what library resources he had and sending without the internet research requ requests across the world to the papal chancery, etc. We know an awful lot about Essex girls. The nuns are barking in Essex because they got his appeal for information and told him an awful lot. And so he was networked as well, even though he didn't move out of Northumbria as far as we know. But one of the works that he wrote, building on earlier works that he'd got from the Celtic orbit, was something called The Holy Places, the De Locus Sanctus. And because of his research into the Bible, the patristics, and the work of the ancients, such as still remain for him to access, he was able to put together a picture linked with the spirit and the imagination of the Near East and the holy places that were still being used as a practical pilgrim's guide in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And so Bede travelled in the spirit and the imagination and allowed others to do not only that, but to do so physically. But Bede was also a cybernaut. <laughs> <laughs> in that his research working on Cicero and others and Pliny led him to actually think about the construct of the solar system. He had the planetary arrangement pretty much in the right order, although like anybody up to Copernicus, he believed that everything revolved around us, we now know better. But he knew about the heavens, he knew about the planets, and because of that and because of his work in also becoming a computer and undertaking the hard number crunching necessary to come up with a well-rounded system by which you had a single dating point from the birth of Christ, year dot, so CE, BCE, okay? And others had experimented with that before, but it was Bede who really worked it all through and, and popularised it. And so it's due to him that we now know we're in 2024. You could leave I know, York in 700 and arrive in Hexham in, in 695. There were lots of local dating systems in place. Some people might say you can still do that today. But <laughs> Bede, he gave us the framework of a unified dating system. And one of his big reasons for that was there was a lot of controversy about things like movable feasts, the dating of Easter. And this was really tearing the new churches of the West apart in the same way that they had been the churches of the East. And so Bede set the might of his computer brain and did the hard work and did a lot of the crunching. And during this, he was observing the lunar cycles and the waxing and waning of the moon as part of establishing the dating of Easter and reconciling the lunar and solar calendars of, of the Jewish and Roman traditions. And that led him to practical experimentation. And Bede actually worked out the gravitational pull of the moon. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, he used it practically to then write the first tide timetables, which were really essential for scudding up the Northumbrian coast. And so, you know, it, it was practical application and experimentation, but grounded on the work of giants and actually looking back and doing the hard graph mining data from the sources that he could put together and then extending it with his own direct observation. So I think, you know, it's that childhood curiosity that really takes him on that trajectory but then there are other things. What else would you like to know about it? <laughs> I mean, that is one heck of a start. <laughs> right. Well, one of the things that I think that you and I could both relate to when we're looking at Bede is this desire to know everything and then to share it. Because not every monk is a priest, but a priest is important because he's giving homilies. So he's yeah. speaking to people. So it feels like he's doesn't just want to know. He wants to share with everybody. And what's interesting about the work that I've learned about from your book as well, is that even though he's doing all this experimental stuff, scientific stuff, that's not weird at this time for a churchman to be doing, but there are people that will poke holes in his theories or be a little bit snide about it. And he causes controversy. And I wanted to bring this up 
to demonstrate that not everybody gets burned as a heretic at this time. <laughs> but also that what's really cool about Bede is that he's continuing to learn and revise based on the feedback that he's getting from other people. So can you tell us a little bit about the pushback that he got a little bit yeah, on yeah. His scientific work? Yeah, let's do it. It wasn't only scientific. He writes at one point that his greatest joy in life had always been study, teaching and writing. And that's his personal vocation. But he sees that very much as part of his priestly vocation. And as you say, it's having a voice in preaching and it's also administering the sacraments. And one thing that comes through in his work too is a great humanity. He likes women, he likes children. There's a great empathy, as well as some of his blind spots of people he really hasn't got a lot of time for. He's very <laughs> human. Mm -hmm. And he got himself into trouble. In actual fact, the big charge of the heresy of innovation that has brought him, you can tell Bede is absolutely flummoxed by it because he's quite humble. But he got caught up in, in a lot of the controversies and churchmanship and the partisan quarrels of his age as well. There's a lot going on. And basically what happens is that Wilfred of York, great prince of the church, had a rather different approach than that of Benedict Biscop, B. Chalfrith, who also thought that the rural pastoral ministry of the dispersed missionary work of people like St. Columba, St. Cuthbert, and Iona and Lindisfarne played a really important part in shaping society and the early church. And bear in mind, this is, you know, about 50 years ago, it had been like the Wild West. <laughs> you know, people were just big fish were eating little fish right, left and centre. Law hadn't been properly established yet. And Christianity was a very, very new thing. And so, you know, it's, it's a lot of, of mileage. And Wilfred took a rather different view. He went to Rome too. He'd been trained on Lindisfarne. And he wanted to rebuild Rome in Britain. And so he starts building programmes as well. But his approach is more to actually, it's top down. OK, so you go for the kings, you go for the pope, you get them on team, you then establish a, a Roman military style hierarchy, which had been attended earlier on, where you've got a hierarchical diocesan structure, archbishops, bishops, parish priests, etc. And, and they all, you know, work to the command chain. Celtic church didn't kind of work like that. And <laughs> Charlemagne hated them later because, of course, they were super territorial. They didn't conform to the borders and the authority points of emergent nations or locally, local authorities. And so, you know, there's a lot of, of this controversy. And Bede does a lot in his writings to support and try and protect Lindisfarne and the Columban and Cuthbertine tradition, which gets him on the wrong side of Wilfred and his followers. And at dinner one night, some of Wilfred's cronies, you can imagine the, you know, the one's currying favour mm -hmm. and they've had a few drinks because Wilfred liked to keep a very opulent table, which B didn't really approve of either. He liked the asceticism and the service and poverty of Lindisfarne. Anyway, so these guys actually say, and it gets back to Wilfred, that they think that b has gone too far. And, and what does he mean putting forward all of these ideas? They don't go for his science. They go for his temerity and actually writing about what the evangelists and the different gospels actually mean, why they couch things differently, why their character is different, and how that reflects upon different aspects of the ministry and mission of Christ. And so we might think now that's what theologians do, and he'd been basing this largely on Augustine and Gregory the Great. Problem was that it was a heresy if you came out with things totally out of thin air. You had to prove that you'd worked hard and you'd, you'd study things. But here they totally shot themselves in the foot because they were nowhere near as widely read as Bede, who just devoured everything that he could get <laughs> hold of. And so he said, but, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Gregory, Gregory Nazianus on, on that because he had the Eastern churchmen as well as the, the ones that they might have heard of. And they probably wouldn't have read them cover to cover like Bede. And so they were totally out witted and he just showed how he got to that conclusion but he got his ultimate revenge because he invented footnotes 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what he would do then, because I think he was also a scribe, I said, I've, I think I found his hand, and a teacher. And a lot of his works were about grammar as well as the nature of things, the nature of time and how to calculate it. It was about rhetoric, oratory, etc., and how you actually have the study tools to study scripture, but also then to write yourself and also to compose poetry and all sorts of things. So he was really tooled up and he invented a system whereby if he was citing or relying on an earlier author, he'd write their initials in the margins as a form of citation. And he also invented like the yellow magic marker. (laughs) He would write little lightning flashes in the margins next to passages where he's actually literally quoting something. And also his hand in Amiatinus, he marks things with Greek letters in the margin because he knew not only Old English and Latin, he knew Greek and he was also very interested in Hebrew. He glosses Hebrew names, personal and place names to actually better understand them. So he's the real thing. He's the real thing. (laughs) And and they they didn't try that again. But he is also radical. And, And you're right, he wasn't condemned in the way in which Wycliffe and Tyndale would be in the later Middle Ages. But Another part of my recent research on on the shoulders of giants who'd gone down this route before was that on his deathbed in 735, we've got an account by those who were with him, his assistant Wilbert, who helped him and, and took dictation. Bede was unusual in his day because he says, and this is in all things, I was both author, notary and scribe. He thought it, he wrote it himself, but he was also the scribe of scripture, the Jewish sofer, a priestly function, an evangelist with the pen. Okay. But he did write things himself, which most authors in antiquity and the Middle Ages didn't. It was voice activated computing, it was dictation. Mm-hmm. And but in the last few weeks, he wasn't able to write. And so Wilbert was with him. And Cuthbert, a priest in the community, also gives us an account. He wrote a um, letter. And so we've got Bede sitting, asking to, to sit on the cold stone floor of the room in which he taught and prayed. And he spent his last days largely engaged in translating John's gospel, the little gospel that treats of the things that were of love, as he called it, as Cuthbert had studied with Boisel at Melrose, um, John the visionary, John the gospel who's used in ministering to the sick and the dying. And he did this to share it with his own people in their own tongue. And he also wrote letters to the Archbishop of York saying, People should be allowed, and parish priests should be allowed to use the Paternoster and the Creed in Old English because even the priests can't really understand the Latin. So that was radical. Now, he wouldn't, I don't think, have been burnt for that because we're at a happy stage when Eastern influences were as important as Central and Western European influences in these islands. And of course, because churches such as Armenia, Syria and Ethiopia had adopted Christianity as their state religion, even ahead of the Roman Empire in the 380s, they'd use their own languages, their own scripts, their own style of art. And the Eastern Empire, its successor Byzantium, just had to wear it because it was already established. And so those influences being born across the Mediterranean and up the Atlantic seaboard on the tail of the prehistoric trading routes, which continue right up to the Viking Age and the 9th century, meant that there were different ways of looking at things. So using your own vernacular would not have seemed such a taboo. Charlemagne, however, trying to create a dispersed territory empire, wants to advocate Latin as the lingua franca and a single-use script, Caroline minuscule for everything, to try and suppress regional identity in the way that de Gaulle, after World War II, would have the heads of schoolchildren in Brittany shaved if they were heard speaking their own language. Okay, so, but this time, I don't think he would have been, but If he'd lived, they might well have got him for it. (laughs) You can't say that they wouldn't. But we thought that we'd lost the work that he did in those final days. But I played a hunch, which other really fine old English language scholars have helped me develop. And we find that part of the gloss that was added to the Lindisfarne Gospels between the lines in the 950s by a monk called Audred after the community had left Lindisfarne and was now at Chesterless Street and then went on to Durham, that 
he actually glossed it in Old English, and part of the gloss of John is in red ink, which is a, a tried and tested way of actually making it more important and stand out. And the red ink includes the chapters that Bede is known to have worked on, up to chapter 6, verse 13. And then Bede leaves us. And it's quite a point to bow out, because it's a point when Christ is about to feed the 5,000. Mm-hmm. And Bede is hungry to be fed himself. So he's off to find Christ. <sighs> but his works remain, and they fed far more than 5,000 people. And it's down to Bede, and we now have that part of it, which is the earliest translation of any part of the Bible that we know of into any Western vernacular language other than Latin, which had earlier been a vernacular but was now, you know, the great lingua sacra along with Greek. And so that was radical. And right up, you know, he's running out of time, but this is so important to give this, to leave it to people. And, of course, that's what the Lollards and others had to fight for, people trying to access scripture in their own language in the 14th, um, late 14th century onwards, and that Tyndale and Wycliffe were condemned for. But Bede was there first, as in so many things. <laughs> you mentioned one of my favorite lines is probably that he's not an ivory tower academic, but an activist. And this, you know, especially if he, he knows he's dying, he's going to go for it. <laughs> Just go for it. Just he get is. that out there. <laughs> and the other thing that he wrote in amongst that last period, he wrote a corker of a letter to Archbishop Egbert, which is very polite, but basically says you've got to protect sacramental pastoral priesthood it's not all about the hierarchy and the rules and the forms you can't jettison the needs of ordinary people in rural environments and these of course are debates that are still very very live in our churches today they're coming at it from the other end they're tr- they're trying to build up whereas we're trying to actually stop people leaving certainly in these islands now but Bede knew it he was on it and he was offering very politely quite incendiary advice to his ultimate boss in the English church if he just stayed on I'm sure he would have got even more into trouble the other thing that he worked on in those last days we don't know what it was he was doing but they say he was also translating some pieces of Isidore of Seville that were very necessary to know. Now, he was another great encyclopedic writer, especially on natural history like Pliny the Elder. But I just wonder, because one of the many copies that Weymouth Jarrow published of Bede's work after his death, because he was so in demand, one of them, The More Bede, which was written within about two, three years of Bede's death, copied at Weymouth Jarrow, belonged at the end of the century, either we think to Alcuin of York, who'd been headhunted by Charlemagne for his intellectual revival in the Carolingian Empire, or by Charlemagne himself, who we know asked for a copy. And the Historia Ecclesiastica ends at 731. Bede lived till 735. Why didn't he extend it? What was he doing? Well, A, what he was doing was writing the sequel to Eusebius's big ecclesiastical history written in the fourth century of the whole of Christianity. So Bede was writing his history of the English church and people to put them in as the Star Wars sequel <laughs> further down the line. So why didn't he carry on until until he died? Well, because the point at which he breaks off in the Historia Ecclesiastica is when the king of Northumbria, Chalwulf, who he thought was a good thing, and Chalwulf is the one who's more sort of liberal in terms of, of wanting to go for different traditions working together and trying to get different peoples working together and, and have more debate, etc. He's deposed, and he actually goes to live on Linda's farm with the monks. bit inconvenient for them because kings aren't. <laughs> quite prepared to live in the frugal poverty, etc. And he did quite like a glass of wine and what have you. But anyway, (laughs) apart from that, they gave him sanctuary and eventually he was actually put back on the throne. And we don't know why his enemies made it necessary for him to become a king in hiding in Clericatu. But a passage that's added in the Morbid, this copy that went later to Carolingia of Bede's work, actually gives a passage from Isidore, as well as Bede's, piece of Bede's old English poetry, Cairdman's hymn, in which the cowherd speaks and God opens his mouth to sing and write poetry. And 
The passage from Isidore there relates to Isidore's teaching on what relationships of marriage were acceptable within the bounds of consanguinity, i.e. don't marry your granny and all of that stuff. But there were many degrees of first, second, third cousins, etc. And it's interesting that that passage from Isidore has been added at the end of Bede. And I just wonder whether the grounds for Trowulf being expelled from the throne by his enemies and having to seek sanctuary at Linda's farm, which Wilfrid's successors were opposed to and were trying to actually get rid and dismantle the Cuthbertine and Columban church in Britain, if it had gone on that way, Charles may well have been deposed because they'd trumped up some charges. We don't know who his mother was, etc. And, you know, that might be what Bede was actually trying to set the record straight on, but he couldn't actually integrate it into his history while the king was still in effectively house arrest imposed from outside at Linda's farm. So, yeah, he's, he's still at it, the boy. <laughs> Right, right up, stirring it right to the end. <laughs> drama, drama, drama. I drama, love it. Drama, drama, yeah. You, you always have these monks that seem like they're going to be separate from everything, even try to be separate from everything, but they're so entangled in everything. But why is he doing it? He's doing it because he knows that good government in state and church, and he's the one who's conce- conceptualising of the idea of there being such a thing in the wreckage of the global economy going into meltdown certainly in the West, and he's the one who sees that it's the work of ordinary men and women taking risks in the most plague-ridden, war-torn, famine-ridden period other than the Black Death in many parts of our world today, that if you haven't got those people actually undertaking that committed work in society and creating sustainable communities, it doesn't matter what kings and the great and the good and emperors do. The minute they lose their heads, you're out, and it crumbles if you're not careful. And so he's got that long view about politics as well as faith and as well as science. And the reason I called the book Bede and the Theory of Everything, which was a bit of a worm on a hook, is because if you read some of the comments by Einstein and Stephen Hawking on the attempt to find the holy grail of the theory of everything in terms of relativity, quantum, which, of course, don't work together, Einstein would say, for example, that, well, I'm not really so interested in detail. What I want to do is glimpse the mind of God. And Hawking, at one point, was toying with thoughts of, could there be a creator, creative force, if you like, and then came to the conclusion that he couldn't personally subscribe to that. And, of course, they would admit that the reason they couldn't actually achieve a theory of everything was that the quantum of faith and spirituality was something that they couldn't integrate into their work. And I think although we're talking about a very, very early stage in the development of science, but I think Bede's mindset is such that it creates a theory of everything. It looks at the nature of time, space, place. It looks at human history. It looks at human nature. It looks on building up inspirational figures such as the cult of St Cuthbert, which he worked with Aad Frith, the Bishop of Lindisfarne, to establish and probably helped advise and in some ways on the making of the Lindisfarne Gospels. And when you look at those incredible opening pages of the Lindisfarne Gospels, where you've got instead of an image of an old man with a beard or a youthful Christ with blonde hair and a long white, white robe, you've got logos, you've got the words explode across the pages like Big Bang. And you've got the cross embedded in that labyrinth with the swirls of all of the elements and the flora and fauna of creation, all sustained by the cross and the word. And this is the cosmic logos that we're talking about being represented here. Faith, the arts, the humanities, the sciences, all coming together to actually try to glimpse our place in the bigger picture, an infinite and eternal picture, and the mind of God. Wow. I could not have ended this any better. (laughs) We brought everything together, bead and the theory of everything coming together. I think that there is so much in this book and so much that you've 
given people a taste of today that will allow people to have a look at beat and recognize somebody who doesn't have a primitive sense of the world, but instead a sense of everything and how it connects and also a joy in sharing it with other people. So、mm. thank you for sharing your joy. Well, you know, <laughs> over he, he wrote pop songs, you know, for, <laughs> for liking songs in his own language. So thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to allow B to still have a voice today. And to still stir it. Thank you, Danya. To find out more about Michelle's work, you can visit her faculty page at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. Her new book is Bead and the Theory of Everything. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey, well, some sad news to start off with. There was an arson attack at a Dublin church, which unfortunately resulted in the destruction of these kind of mummified remains. And one belonged to an 800 year old mummy nicknamed the Crusader.、Mm, that's a shame. This has been weird because this church has been targeted a few times over the years. We had reported once someone came in and hacked off his head and took it away. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but was found, returned to police a few days later. But unfortunately, someone lit a fire, and then the water system kicked in. And last we know, is it was about a foot of water in there, and some of the remains have been completely destroyed. So it's an unfortunate loss.、Mm -hmm. Irreplaceable. Yeah, yeah. Also, just on those brighter side, we have a、uh, thirty-five medieval expressions created by Chaucer. Well, he did write a lot of lines. <laughs> yes, yeah, I I could have been quite a lot more, but I picked the ones I thought were the best. And there's some funny stuff that we still use, right? Busy as a bee,、mm -hmm. to, to hang in the balance. And my favorite one is in one year and out the other, <laughs> which has been said of me many a time. So <laughs> I have no comment, no comment to make on that. Well, thank you, Peter, for bringing us the good news and the bad news. Everyone will have to check out your articles to find out more about what happened in Dublin, and also just to have a relaxing time with Chaucer. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. This week on my mini series, this is history presents the Iron King. King Philip the Fair goes after the Knights Templar, ripping up the military order by the roots and burning it to ash. It's Philip's unique combination of psychology, evil minions, mistrust of the papacy, and practice at mass persecution that makes the destruction of the Templars possible at all. So I hope you'll enjoy being able to see how everything in Philip's past so far leads to this massive moment in medieval history. And over on This Is History Plus, Dan Jones and I talk about whether my firefighter analogy works, whether or not we should make a sexy history calendar, and Dan's own experience of meeting modern versions of the Templars in real life. You can find the Iron King wherever you listen to this podcast, and you can try This Is History Plus for free at thisishistorypod.com. Thank you, as always, for all your support, especially if you're a patron on Patreon.com, because patrons are the wonders of the world who allow me to do this work in the first place. If you'd like to become a patron, please head over to Patreon.com/medievalists. Or if you'd like to support my work another way, you can visit tpublic.com/stores/medievalistsnet to pick up some sweet medieval merch and show off your awesomeness. And if you do, take a pic and tag me so that I can say thanks in the comments. For everything from bead to well, beads, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or X at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at Five M I N Medievalist or Five Minute Medievalist, and you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of Chivalry and Courtesy: Medieval Manners for a Modern World, now out in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a wonderful day.